Hello, my name is Sin Bagley, and I'm re reading The Skylark of Space by E.E. E. Doc Smith in collaboration with Lee Hawkins Garby. I am on Chapter 14, Nell Boone, Unmasked. After a long sleep, Seaton awoke and sprang out of bed. No sooner had he started to shave, however, that one of the slaves touched his arm, motioning him into a reclining chair and showing him a clean keen blade, long and slightly curved. Seaton lay down, and the slave shaved him with a rapidity and smoothness he had never before experienced. So wonderfully sharp was a peculiar razor. After Seaton had dressed, the barber started to shave the chief slave without any preliminary treatment save rubbing his face with a perfumed oil. Hold on a minute, interjected Seaton, who was watching the process with interest. Here's something that helps a lot. He lathered the face with his brush, and the man looked up in surprise, pleasure as his stiff beard was swept away without a sound. Seaton called to the others, and soon the party was assembled in his room, all dressed very lightly because of the unrelieved and unvarying heat, which was constant at 100 degrees. A gong sounded, and one of the slaves opened the door, ushering in a party of servants bearing a table ready set. During the meal, Seaton was greatly surprised at hearing Dorothy carrying on a halting conversation with one of the women standing behind her. I knew that you were a language shark, Dottie, with five or six different ones to your credit, but I didn't suppose you could learn to talk this stuff in one day. I can't, she replied, but I picked up a few words of it. I can understand very little of what they're trying to tell me. The woman spoke rapidly to the man be standing behind Seaton, and as soon as the table had been carried away, he asked permission to speak to Dorothy. Fairly running across to her, he made a slight obeisance, and in eager tones poured forth such a stream of language that she held up her hand to silence him. Go slower, please, she said, and added a couple words in his own tongue. There ensued a strange dialogue with many repetitions and much use of signs. She turned to Seaton with a puzzled look. I can't make out what he says, Dick, but he wants you to take him into another room of the palace here to get back something or other that they took from him when they captured him. He can't go alone. I think he says he will be killed if he goes anywhere without you. And he says that when you get there, you must be sure not to let the guards come inside. All right, let's go, said Seaton, motioned to the man to precede him. As Seaton started for the door, Dorothy fell into step beside him. Better stay back, Dotty. I'll be back in a minute, he said at the door. I will not stay back. Wherever you go, I go, she replied with a voice inaudible to the others. I simply will not stay away from you a single minute that I don't have to. All right, little girl, he replied in the same tone. I don't want to be away from you either, and I don't think that we're in any danger here. Preceded by the chief sleeve and followed by half a dozen others, they went out into the hall. No opposition was made to their progress, but a full half-company of armed guards fell in behind them as an escort regarding Seaton with looks composed of equal parts of reverence and fear. The slave led the way rapidly to a room in a distant wing of the palace and opened the door. As Seaton stepped in, he saw that he was evidently in an audience chamber or courtroom and that it was now entirely empty. As the guard approached the door, Seaton waved them back. All retreated across the hallway except the officer in charge who refused to move. Seaton, the personification of offended dignity, first stared at the offender who returned the stare and stepped up to him insolently, then pushed him back roughly, forgetting that his strength, great upon the earth, would be gigantic upon the small world. The officer spun across the corridor, knocked down three of his men in his flight. Picking himself up, he drew his sword and rushed, while his men fled in panic to the extreme end of the corridor. Seaton did not wait for him, but in one bound, leaped halfway across the intervening space to meet him. With the vastly superior agility of his earthly muscles, he dutched the falling broadsword and dove his left fist full against the man's chin. With all the force of his mighty arm and all the momentum of his rapidly moving body behind the blow, the crack of breaking bones was distinctly audible as the officer's head snapped back. The force of the blow lifted him high into the air, and after turning a complete somersault, he brought up with a crash across the opposite wall, dropping to the floor stone dead. As several of his men, braver than the others, lifted their peculiar rifles, Seaton drew and fired in an incredibly swift motion, the explosive bullet blittering the entire group of men and demolishing that end of the palace. In the meantime, the slave had taken several pieces of apparatus from the cabinet in the room and had placed them in his belt, stopping only to observe for a few moments a small instrument which he climbed upon the 
clumped, clamped upon the head of the dead man, he rapidly led the way back to the room they had left and set to work upon the instrument he had constructed while the others had been asleep. He connected it in an intricate system of wiring with the pieces of apparatus he had just recovered. That's a complex job of wiring, said Duchesne admiringly. I've seen several intricate pieces of apparatus myself, but he has so many circuits there that I'm lost. It would take an hour to figure out the lines and connections alone. Straightening abruptly, the slave clamped several electrodes upon his temples and motioned to Seton and the others, speaking to Dorothy as he did so. He wants us to let him put these things on our heads. She translated, shall we let him, Dick? Yes, he replied without hesitation. I got a real hunch that he's our friend, and I'm not sure of Nell Boone. He doesn't act right. I think so too, agreed the girl, and Crane added, I can't say that I relish the idea, but soon I know that you're a good poker player, Dick. I am willing to follow your hunch. How about you, Duchesne? Not I, declared the worthy emphatically. Nobody wires me up to anything. I can't understand, and that machine is too deep for me. Margaret elected to follow Crane's example, and impressed by the speed for the haste evident in the slave's bearing, the four walked up to the machine without further talk. The electrodes were clamped up into place quickly, and the slave pressed a lever. Instantly, the four visitors felt they had a complete understanding of the languages and customs of both Mardinale, the nation in which they now were, and of Condal, to which nation the slaves belonged, the only two civilized nations upon the Snomni. While the look of amazement at this method of receiving instruction was still upon their faces, the slave, or rather, as they now knew him, Dunark, the Kofedex, or crown prince of the great nation of Condal, began to disconnect the wires. He cut out the wires leading to the two girls and to Crane, and was reaching for Seton when there was a blinding flash, a crackling sound, the heavy smoke of burning metal and insulation, and both Dunark and Seton fell to the floor. Before Crane could reach them, however, they were upon their feet, and the stranger said in his own tongue, now understood by everyone, but to Shane. This machine is a mechanical educator, a thing entirely new in our world at least, although I have been working on it for a long time. It is still in a very crude form. I did not like to use it in its present state of development, but it was necessary in order to warn you of what Naboon is going to do to you, and to convince you that the best way of saving your lives would to save our lives as well. The machine worked perfectly until something, I don't know what, went wrong. Instead of stopping as it should have at teaching your party to speak our language, it short circuited as us two completely, so that every convolution to each of our brains has been imprinted upon the brain of the other. It was a sudden formation of all the new convolutions that rendered us unconscious. I can only apologize for the breakdown and assure you that my intentions were of the best. You needn't apologize, returned Seton. That was a wonderful performance, and we're both gainers anyway, aren't we? It has taken us all our lives to learn what little we know, and now we each have the benefit of two lifetimes spent upon different worlds. I must admit, though, that I have a whole lot of knowledge I don't know how to use. I am glad you take it that way, returned the other warmly, for I am infinitely better off for the exchange. The knowledge I imparted was nothing compared to what, to that which I received, but time presses. I must tell you our situation. I am, as you know, the Kofedix of Condal. The other thirteen are Fido and Fidero, or as you would say, prince, princes and princesses of the same nation. We were captured by one of Nalboon's raiding parties while upon a hunting trip, being overcome by some new stupefying gas so that we could not kill ourselves. As you know, Condell and Mardinel have been at war for over 10,000 Karkamu, something more than 6,000 years of your time. The war between us is one of utter extermination. Captives are never exchanged, and only once during an ordinary lifetime does one ever escape. Our intendants were killed immediately. We were being taken to furnish sport for Nalboon's party by being fed to one of the captive Colono, animals something like your earthly devil fish. When the escort of battleships was overcome by those four Colono, the animals you saw, and one of them seized Nalboon's plane in which we were prisoners. You killed the Carlon, saving our lives as well as those of, of Nalboon and his party. Having saved his life, you and your party should be honored guests of the most honored kind, and I venture to say that you would be so regarded in any other nation of, of the universe. But Nalboon, the Damak, a tr title equivalent to your word emperor, and our word Carfadex of Mardinal, is utterly without either honor or conscience, as are all Mardinal lions. At first, he was afraid of you, as were we all. We thought you visitors from a planet, 
of our 15th sun, which is now at its nearest possible approach to us, after your display of superhuman power and ability, we expected instant annihilation. However, after seeing the Skylark as a machine, discovering that you are short of power, and finding that you are gentle instead of bloodthirsty by nature, Naboon lost his fear of you and resolved to rob you of your vessel, which is wonderful secrets of power. Though we are so ignorant of chemistry that I cannot understand the thousandth part of what I just learned from you, we are a race of mechanics and have developed machines of many kinds to a high state of efficiency including electrical machines of all kinds. In fact, electricity generated by our great waterfalls is our only power. No scientist upon Asani has ever had an inkling that intra-atomic energy exists. Now Boone cannot understand the power, but he solved the means of liberating it at a glance, and that glance sealed your death warrants. With a skylark, he could conquer Kondal, and to assure the downfall of my nation, he would do anything. Also, he or any other Osomnian scientist would go to any lengths, whatever, would challenge the great first cause itself to secure even one of these little bottles of chemicals you call salt. is far and away the scarcest and most precious substance in the world. It's so rare that most bottles you produce at the table held more than total amount previously known to exist upon Osnomi. We have great abundance of all the heavy metals, but the lighter metals are rare. Sodium and chlorine Chlorine are the rarest of all known metals elements. It is immense value is due not to its rarity, but to the fact that it is an indispensable component of the controlling instruments of our wireless power stations, and that it is used as a catalyst in the manufacture of our hardest metals. For these reasons, you understand why Nalboon does not intend to let you escape, and why he intends that this kokam, our equivalent of a day, shall be your last. About the second or third cam hour of the sleeping period, he intends to break into the Skylark, learn his control, and secure the salt you undoubtedly have in the vessel. Then my party and myself will be thrown to the Kaloon. You and your party will be killed, and your bodies smelted to cover the salt that is in them. This is the warning I had to give you. Its urgency explains the use of my untried mechanical educator. The hope that my party could escape with yours in our, your vessel explains why you saw me, the Cofidex of Condal, prostrate myself before that arch-fiend, Nalboon. How do you, a captive prince of another nation, know these things? asked Crane doubtfully. I read Nabun's ideas from the brain of that officer whom the Kafadex Seton killed. He was a Ladex of the guards, an officer about the same rank as one of your colonels. He was high in Nabun's favor, and he was to have been in charge of the work of breaking into the Skylark and killing us all. Let me caution you now. Do not let Mardonolian touch your hands with a wire, for if they do, your thoughts will be recorded, and the secrets of the Skylark and your many other mysterious things, such as smoking matches and magic feats, will be secrets no longer. Thanks for the information, responded Seton, but I want to correct your title for me. I am no Kofadex, merely a plain citizen. In one way, I see that as true, replied the Kofidex with a puzzled look. I cannot understand your government at all, but the inventor of the Skylark must certainly rank as a Kofidex. As he spoke, a smile of understanding passed over his face and continued, I see your title is Doctor of Philosophy, which means that you are a Kofidex of Knowledge of the Earth. No, no, you're way off. I'm certainly Seton is a Kofidex of Knowledge, broke in Duchesne. Let it go at that anyway. Whatever it means, the thing to do now is to figure a way out of this. You chirped it then, Blackie. Do Denmark, you know this country better than we do. What do you suggest? I suggest that you take my party into the Skylark and escape from Mondale as, as soon as possible. I can pilot you to Condelec, the capital of our nation. There, I can assure you, we will be welcomed as you deserve. My father, the Carfedix, will treat you as a Carfedix should be treated. As far as I am concerned, nothing I can ever do will lighten the burden of my indebtedness to you. But I promise you all the copper you want and anything you may desire that is within the power of man to give you. Seton thought deeply a moment, then shook Dunmark's hand vigorously. That suits me, Kofidex, he said warmly. I thought from the third, first that you were our friend. Shall we make for the Skylark now or wait a while? We had better wait until after the second meal, the prince replied. We have no armor and no way of making any. We would be helpless against the bullets of any, except a small group small enough so that you could kill them all before they could fire. The chem, after the second meal, is devoted to strolling about the ground so that our visiting the Skylark would look perfectly natural. As the guard is very lax at the time, it is the best time for the attempt. 
But how about my killing his company of guards and blowing up one wing of his palace? Won't he have something to say about that? I don't know, replied the Kofidix doubtfully. It depends on whether his fear of you or his anger is greater. He should pay his call stay here in your apartment in a short time, as it is an invaluable rule of us Nami that any visitor shall receive a call of state from one of his own rank before leaving his apartment for the first time. His actions may give you some idea to his, as to his feelings, though he is an accomplished diplomat and may conceal his real feelings entirely. But let me caution you not to be modest or soft-spoken. He will mistake softness for fear. All right, Grinson. In that case, I won't try to find out what he thinks. If he shows any signs of hostility at all, I'll open up on him. Well, remarked Crane calmly, if we have some time to spare, we may as well wait comfortably instead of standing in the middle of the room. I, for one, have a lot of questions to ask about this new world. Acting upon the suggestion, the party seated themselves upon capital divans and Denmark rapidly dismantled the machine he had constructed. The captives remained standing, always behind the visitors, until Seaton remonstrated. Please sit down, everybody. There's no need of keeping up this farce of you being slaves as long as you were alone, is there, Dunark? No, but at the first sound of the gong announcing a visitor, we must be in our places. Now that we are all comfortable and waiting, I will introduce in my party to yours. Philly Condolians greet the Cafedo, Carfedo. Seaton and Craney began, his tongue fumbling over the strange names of a distant world, the earth, and the two noble ladies, Miss Vanman and Miss Spencer, soon to be their cofadero. Guests from earth, allow me to present to you the cofader Sitar, the one of my wives who accompany me upon our ill-fated hunting expedition. Then, still ignoring Duchenne as a captive, he introduced the other Condolians in turn as his brothers, sisters, cousins, nieces, and nephews, all members of the great ruling house of Condal. Now, he concluded, after I have a word with you in pri private, Dr. Seaton, I'll be glad to give the others all the information in my power. He led Seaton out of earshot, and the others said in a low voice, It is no part of Nalboon's plan to kill the two women. They are so beautiful, so different from our Osnomian women, that he intends to keep them alive. Understand? Yes, returned Seaton grimly, his eyes turning hard. I get you all right, but what he'll do and what he thinks he'll do are two different breeds of cats. Returning to the others, he found Dorothy and Sitar deep in conversation. So a man has half or a dozen or so wives? Dorothy was asking in surprise. How do you get along together? I'd fight like a wildcat if my husband tried to have other wives. We get along splendidly, of course, returned the Nomian princess in equal surprise. I would not think of being a man's only wife. I wouldn't consider marrying a man who would win only one wife. Think what a disgrace it would be. And think how lonely one would be while her husband is away at war. We would go insane if we did not have the company of the other wives. There are six of us, and we could not get along at all without each other. I've got a compliment for you and Peggy, Dottie, said Seaton. Dunnark here thinks that you two girls look good enough to eat, or words to that effect. Both girls flushed slightly, the purplish black color suffusing their faces. They glanced at each other, and Dorothy voiced the thought of both of them as she said, How can you, Cofidix Dunnark, in this horrible light? We both look perf perfectly dreadful. These other girls would be beautiful if we were used to the colors, but we two look simply hideous. Oh no, interrupted Sitar, you have wonderfully rich coloring. It is a shame to hide so much of yourself with robes. Their eyes interpret colors differently than ours do, explained Seaton. What to us are harsh and discordant colors are light and pleasing to their eyes. What looks like a kind of sloppy greenish black to us may, in fact, does look like pale pink to them. Are Kandal and Mardinal the only two nations upon Asnami? asked Crane. The only civilized nations, yes. Asnami is divided into two great and almost equal continents, separated by a wide ocean which encircles the globe. One is Kondal and the other Mardinal. Each nation has several nations or tribes of savages which inhabit various waste places. You are the light race, Mardinal the dark, continued Crane. What are the servants who seem halfway between? They are slaves. Captured savages, interrupted Dorothy. No, they are a separate race. They are a race of low and intelligent that they cannot exist except as slaves, but they can be trained to understand language and to do certain kinds of work. They are harmless and mild, making excellent service. Otherwise, they would have perished years ages ago. 
All menial work and most of the manual labor is done by the slave race. Formerly criminals were sterilized and reduced to unwilling slavery. There have been no unwilling slaves in Condal for the hundreds of Carcamo. Why? Are there no criminals anymore? No, with the invention of the thought recorder and an absolutely fair trial was assured and the guilty were all convicted. They could not reproduce themselves and as a natural result, crime died out. That is, he added hastily, what we guarded as crime. Dueling, for instance, is a crime upon earth. Here it is regular custom. In Condell, duels are rather rare and held only when honor is involved. But here in Marnal, they are an everyday affair, as you saw when you landed. What makes the difference? asked Dorothy cur curiously. As you know, with us, every man is a soldier. In Condal, we train our youth in courage, valor, and high honor. In Marnal, they train them in savage bloodthirstiness alone. Each nation fixed its policy in bygone ages to produce the type of soldier it thought most effective. I notice that everyone here wears those heavy collars, said Margaret. What are they for? They are identification marks. When a child is nearly grown, a collar bearing his name and the device of his house is cast upon his neck. This collar is made of aranak, a synthetic metal which once formed cannot be altered by any usual means. It cannot be scratched, cut, bent, broken, or worked in any way except at such a high temperature that death would result. If such heat were applied to the collar, once the aranak collar is cast upon a person's neck, he is identified for life, and any adult osnomia not wearing a collar is put to death. That must be an interesting metal, remarked Crane. Is your belt a similar mark? This belt is an idea of my own, said Dunark, smiled broadly. It looks like an opaque arnock, but it isn't. It's merely a pouch in which I carry anything I am particularly interested in. Even now, Boone thought it was an arnock, so he didn't trouble to try to open it. If he had opened it and taken my tools and instruments, I wouldn't have built the educator. Is this transparent armor arnock? Yes, the only difference being that nothing is added to the matrix in, to color or to or make opaque the finished metal. It is the preparation of this metal that salt is indispensable. It acts only as a catalyst being recovered afterward, but neither nation has ever had enough salt to make all the armor they want. Aren't those monsters, Carlono, I think you call them, covered by the same thing? And what are those animals anyway? Dorothy asked. Yes, they are armored with Aranak, and it's thought that the beasts grow it, the same as fishes grow scales. The Carlono are the most frightful scourge of the Asnami. Very little is known of them, though every scientist theorized upon them since time immemorial. It is very seldom that one is ever killed, as they easily outfly our swiftest battleships, and only fight when they can be victorious. To kill one requires a succession of the heaviest high explosive shells in the same spot, a joint in the armor, and after the armor is once penetrated, the animal is blown into each small fragment. That reconstruction is impossible. From such remains, it's been variously described as a bird, a beast, a fish, and a vegetable. Sexual, asexual, hermaphroditic. Its habitat is unknown, it being variously supposed to live high in the air, deep in the ocean, and buried in the swamps. Another theory is that they live upon one of our satellites, which encounters our belt of atmosphere every car calm. Nothing is certainly known about the monsters except their terrible destructiveness and their insatiable appetites. One of them will devour five or six airships at one time, absorbing the crews and devouring the cargo and all the vessels except the very hardest of the metal parts. Do they usually go in groups, asked Crane? If they do, I should think that a fleet of warships would be necessary for every party. No, they are almost always found alone. Only very rarely are two found together. This is the first time in history that more than two have ever been seen together. Two battleships are always defeat one Carlon, so they are never attacked. With four battleships, Nobun considered his expedition perfectly safe, especially as they were now rare. The navies hunted down and killed what was supposed to be the last one upon Osnami more than a car come ago, and none have been seen since until we were attacked. The gong over the door sounded, and the Condolians leaped to their position back of the earthly visitors. The Kofidex went to the door. Nalboon brushed him aside and entered, escorted by a full company of heavily armed soldiery. A scowl of anger was upon his face, and he was plainly in an ugly mood. Stop, Nalboon of Mardanel, thundered Seton in the Mardanian thun th 
tongue with the full power of his mighty voice. Dare you invade my privacy unannounced and without invitation? The escort shrank back, but the dome mark stood his ground, although he was plainly taken back. With an apparent effort, he smoothed his face into lines of cordiality. I merely came to inquire why my guards are slain and my palace destroyed by my honored guest. As for slaying your guards, they sought to invade my privacy. I warned them away, but one of them was foolish enough to try to kill me. Then the others attempted to raise their childish rifles against me, and I was obliged to destroy them. As for the wall, it happened to be in the way of the thought waves I hurled against your guards. Consequently, it was demolished. An honored guest, bah, our honored guest put on to the indignity of being touched by the filthy hands of a mere ladix. You do not object to the touch of slaves, with a wave of his hand toward the condolians. That is what slaves are for, Coley. It is a domoc to wait upon himself. Is a domoc to wait upon himself in the court of Mondanel? But to return to the issue, were I an honored guest, this would never have happened. No, Nalboon, that when you attempt to treat a visiting domoc of my race as a low-born captive, you must be prepared to suffer the consequences of your rashness. May I ask you how, how you so recently ignorant know our language? You question me? That is bold. Know that I, the boss of the road, show ignorance or knowledge, and when and where I please, you may go. And that is the end of chapter 14.